Hello! Um, so for today, I thought I will talk a bit about a pretty hot topic, vocal fry. So, um, I might need to pull the microphone closer to me when I do that because the fry is a little harder to, um, hear sometimes. It's not very loud. So, vocal fry. So, essentially that's what vocal fry is. It's that sort of crackly sound. It's way down here like this. I'm just talking in a vocal fry right now, like whatever, you know. Um, <laughs> so it's this big dippy uh, crackly sound and it's become a really hot topic in linguistics. It's become a really hot topic, I think, with singers, with voice therapists, and it's just becoming this big thing. You could actually go to NPR's website and Google uh, or search for Vocal Fry articles and podcasts and stuff. They actually have a ton of stuff on it there. Um, it's something you hear in, like, Zoe Deschanel when she speaks. Um, I think it was populated or it became popular in California, I think. Mm, and you hear it. It's pretty prevalent in a lot of uh, females who are from... I think it's Southern California. I don't think Northern California has it as much, but I'm not sure. Um, I was raised in the South, so I don't, I did not grow up around uptalk or vocal fry. And you do hear those things a bit the same. Now, uptalk is uh, when the intonation, which is the melody of speech, essentially goes up at the end of a statement instead of, so it sounds like someone's maybe uh, asking a question when the words are actually a statement. Um, which is also, I believe, mm, it's being debated whether it's a dialect or not. Um, we'll get to that in a second. But, so, up talk is like, it sounds like this. Um, and then vocal fry is like when it sounds like this. <laughs> okay. Um, so, it's a hot topic. And, like I said, a lot of people are, um, debating about it. Uh, in the voice therapy world, vocal fry was associated with voice disorders for a very long time. Usually the only time you really heard someone using fry excessively was when they had some sort of injury or they had inadequate um, breath support or inadequate, subglo inadequate subglottal pressure. Perhaps they kept talking way past where their lungs are essentially empty and then it got really hard for them to keep going and it sounded a little like that. Um, so it was a bit associated with things like that, with patient populations who had difficulty with their breathing patterns in relation to voicing uh, during speech or to people who had some sort of lesion or something. Um, so I think, now, funny thing about human brains, we all of our brains are a little stupid. It's kind of true. Um, we all have these logical fallacies that it's really easy to fall into, and psychologically it's just it's just the thing. It's the thing we all have and we all do. Um, so I think it became a bit of a fallacy to think of Fry as causal to the vocal problem, um, but that is sort of how folks swung in their minds, which makes sense. If you're seeing people with problems all the time and you're hearing an excessive amount of vocal fry use from these people, it would stand to reason that you would think, okay, there might be something to do with that vocal fry habit you have as to why you might be in this office with me, all of these folks. Um, so I don't blame anyone for thinking it's a little causal, because like I said, everybody's brain is a little bit stupid sometimes. Um, ooh, I should make a t-shirt, right? Everybody's brain is a little stupid sometimes. Okay, that's going to be my new motto. Um, but <laughs> yeah, so there hasn't actually been any evidence that it's causal, though. So. No evidence that vocal fry causes any kind of vocal injury um, or results in vocal injury for long-term vocal fry usage. Anecdotally, my biggest evidence for that is my sister. My sister has used vocal fry, ooh, I don't know, since puberty. Uh, and um, hey, love you, hey sis. But you do use vocal fry a lot. And um, a lot of it is she speaks at a really low vocal pitch. She tends to, I'll, I'll do a little impression of my sister. I can sound a lot like her. Um, we actually used to get confused on the phone for a while. Um, so anyway, 
Um, so if you were talking to my sister, she'd probably be talking more like down here like this. Um, I have to be a little bit quieter to do it. And then she just kind of drops into fry a lot when she finishes her phrases at the end. Um, it's not super uncommon for her to basically spend like most of her phrase in vocal fry. This is just, it's just sort of one of those things that my sister does a lot. And I notice it on the phone with her. And when we're talking together, we tend to end up sounding a bit like this. I, <laughs> so, so a lot of times, like if I'm FaceTiming with her and my mom or whatever, um, I end up sounding a bit like my sister because I tend to imitate people who I'm around vocally. So um, yeah, I tend to pick up their habits a lot. Um, so it's interesting, but that's, um, that's one of the things... So my sister, like, her voice is fine. She's a physical therapist. She does her job. She does what she wants to do. Uh, you know, it, there's I don't hear any evidence of any problems, and it's certainly not causing her any problems to the point where she feels she needs to get it looked at. But she has legitimately been using Fry. I would say more than 50% of her voicing has probably been vocal Fry for the last, like, 30 years of her life, and she's fine. So anecdotally, it's not hard science, but anecdotally, uh, I have seen it myself that somebody can use Fry for a really long time and they're fine, vocally wise. So it's actually using Fry with vocal strain that's the bigger problem. Vocal strain is the bigger enemy. So if you're like pressing to get your Fry out and it's a little like that, do you hear that difference? I hope it was clear. So it has that crackle, but it's actually really strained. That is me, I'm squeezing a bit right here on purpose um, to try to show you. So it can have that crackly sound, but if it's like pressed, if it's kind of effortful to do, that is the bigger issue. That's like a bigger sign of possibly a bigger problem and or something that might lead to a bigger problem. But for the folks, the celebrities out there, for like the Zoe Deschanel's, who sometimes use vocal fry when they're talking. Like when you say, hey, what'd you do today? And they go, well, I went to the grocery store and then I went to the park and I saw this really cute dog. It was so cute. If you hear people talk like that and they're not really straining very much when they drop down like that, it's just happening. Um, it might be really annoying for you to hear. You might not like the sound. You might think it sounds grating. You might think it sounds stupid or whatever. But that's your judgment on it. It doesn't mean that their voice is in danger or straining or having a bigger problem for them. Um, so it's just something to keep in your hat, like something to think about. Um, if you're a voice teacher and you have a lot of students coming into your studio using this kind of vocal fry, I'm not much of a prescriptivist. So I've actually changed my mind a bit. I didn't like vocal fry for the longest time. Um, but I've changed my mind a bit about it because I think it is a bit of a dialect. It's it's something that people are using uh, a lot. It's it's just it seems to be a bit of a generational difference. Um, the younger, particularly younger females, it shows up. Excuse me, shows up very frequently uh, in their speech patterns. And yeah, I just think it's becoming a bit of a cultural thing to use it, a, a dialect thing. So. And the thing about dialect, you know, uh, speech language pathology makes it pretty clear, we try to make it pretty darn clear, that dialect is a difference, it's not a disorder. So that means, you know, I grew up in the South. So um, when I moved to Colorado, I would still find myself using phrases like, I might could do that. Like, hey, Kim, are you available at this time this day? Yeah, I might could, I might could do that, you know, as my natural response. Um, and, you know, and I didn't even think anything of it until someone pointed out, you know, somebody's like, I think it's so cute that you use might could. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I didn't even think about it. But it's just a dialect thing. It's a thing I picked up in the South. Um, yes, it's not proper standard American English, but it is a phrase that's commonly used. And I can use language differently, though. I can learn proper use of language. I am I have the capability in my brain to put together a grammatically correct sentence. I understand what that should be. I understand all of this stuff. Now, if, you, if somebody lacks that, if somebody has a disorder or they have um, difficulty with language processing, 
somehow in their brain, whether they were born with it or whether they adopt, you know, it came as a result of, say, a brain injury or something, um, that is a disorder. That's when somebody, they might, they say might could, and they, it's not a dialect for them. They're not from the South. It's not something they're just using colloquially, colloquially, blah, 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 colloquially. Um, it's, it's, it's an incorrect use of the language. So that is the distinction in speech language pathology. So dialect is just different. It's not disordered. And I am personally starting to lean toward the idea that Fry has become a bit of kind of like a dialect. It's just a difference. It's something people are using. It's, it's present. Men do it too. A lot of men use Fry. Um, there's, of course, there's the social question of do we not mind it when men use Fry? There's probably a bit of that, that people don't really mind it when men do it. But I honestly... I don't think anyone's done any studies on this, but it would be interesting to me to find out if it's actually a little less noticeable when men use vocal fry, especially men with low vocal pitch when they speak, you know, like kind of your basses and your like low voiced males, um, because they tend to fall into fry a lot that I've noticed. But, you know, if, uh, say, an opera singer bass is like on stage and they go into this kind of gravelly low note way down there. Like, nobody seems to mind that much, you know? But it's still fry, you know? Um, so, <laughs> it's interesting to me because I am almost wondering if it's less noticeable because they're already speaking at a really low pitch, uh, their vocal tract is larger, larger objects resonate at lower frequencies. Um, that's why, you know, for musicians out there, when you think of a pipe organ, right? The lower pipes are larger. That's why cellos are larger than violins, you know? Like, they're, they're large. It's larger. It's a lower instrument. Um, so, and it sounds lower overall. Even if a cello is hitting the same note that a violin is hitting, it probably sounds like a lower note because the cello is accentuating the lower frequencies that are contained within that note, essentially within that string that's vibrating. So, um, voice can be very similar. Uh, if you have a larger air cavity, the lower frequencies are going to be excited more, it's going to sound rich, it's going to sound dark, it's going to sound low, and if that person with that low, rich, dark voice slips into fry, maybe we don't notice it as much, because it's not that much of a, an acoustic shift, it's not that big of a change. Perhaps. It would be interesting to know. Do we perceive it a little differently in males? And now that I think about it, that might be a research topic I want to look at at some point in the future. Hmm. But, <laughs> um, so maybe it's not socially constructed. Maybe it's just we literally don't notice it as much. Could be. Um, but that's what I think. I think Fry is just not too much of a thing. Um, oh, and I just realized I have not even mentioned... Fry actually is a different vibrational pattern of the vocal folds. That's why it sounds kind of creaky like that. Uh, it has that sort of, uh, that little poppy kind of sound like that. Um, so the vocal folds are actually vibrating in a different pattern than what they, what you typically see. They've sort of taken on this different posture. And there's actually a bit of a secondary frequency that's very low because those little pops essentially are happening, happening at a much lower frequency than what you typically hear as a pitch. But there's also additional vibration happening on top of those little pops. And so you actually have a little bit of two, two frequencies essentially happening at once, um, which also makes it a little tricky because if you're measuring someone's vocal range and they go into fry, that's kind of an artificial low pitch. So if I'm using software and I go like this on it, um, it might say my pitch is something like 70 hertz, like the fry pitch, it probably will tell me something very low, like 70. That does not mean I can hit 70 hertz clearly. I can't. That means those pops and those clicks are happening at about 70 hertz, and the software is only telling me those pops and clicks. That's what it's picking up as the lowest, as the fundamental frequency, as sort of the bottom of it all. So, um, so just let, to let you know, if you're ever testing your vocal range, if you go into a fry, you're going to get an artificially low number. Um, 
because that's what the software is analyzing as the lowest fundamental, the lowest frequency you're putting out. Good to know. Um, I guess if you're a bass and you use Fry performance-wise and everybody loves it, you can count that as part of your range. I mean, it doesn't really matter. But if you're a soprano or something or a tenor, eh, Fry might not be very usable. It might not be a thing that you want to say as part of your vocal range. <laughs> okay, so... Um, Yes, that is my little spiel on vocal fry. If you have any additional questions about it, or if you would like me to talk a little further or expound a little more, I would be happy to do so. Um, I'm actually going to follow this up with a video on vocal pitch because that also is a bit of a debated area, especially among singers. Um, and I do have, of course, opinions about that. So I will see you next time for that. Bye!